Welcome to Taste of the Club, the podcast for business owners from the Global Business Owners Network of Business Friendship. This is where you get the insights from founders and investors on their career and personal development. So, welcome to the Global Business Owners Podcast, A Taste of the Club, where we each time bring an interesting GBO member as a guest. We who are hosting the podcast are John A. Ball, an influence coach and trainer in presentation skills. John also has his own podcast called The Lucky Podcast that focuses on public speaking. John is also our president in our GBO Valencia chapter. John, how are you today? Really good, thank you. It's a beautiful day here in Valencia. Same here in Stockholm. Uh, my name is uh, Rikard Wikström. I'm the global president of GBO, and I also hold the position as president in our Stockholm chapter. Uh, my background is in the cosmetic business, where I've held several positions from sales representative to CEO over the past 30 years. And today, I am investing and consulting in startups in the cosmetics and experience business on a board level. Uh, usually with us is also Maiten Panella, who is a psychologist specializing in business psychology for entrepreneurs. But today she has other pressing engagements, so you have to cope with only me and John today. The format of this podcast is the same as a regular GBO meeting, where we meet regularly meet based on the founding idea of GBO, business friendship. The idea with GBO and business friendship is to start with the friendship part, not the business part. Thus to find people you want to work with rather than the ones you have to. Today's very special guest is Isabel Askevik, one of the GBO Stockholm members, but also one of our members who have traveled the most and visited more chapters meeting outside of Sweden than in her home chapter. Isabel, warm welcome to the GBO podcast, The Taste of the Club. Thank you, and thank you for having me. Isabel, let's start basic. Who are you? So, my name is Isabel Akovic, and I'm based out of Stockholm, Sweden, working for a company called Sido, providing an Ampos and Omnichannel platform for global retailers. Uh, I do have a background with an extensive international background within both retail and software. So I have pretty much a depth, deep insight into understanding how the IT and digital solutions can, can benefit business and how to grow kind of pretty much as a startup or tech, tech business into larger businesses. So what, what is your position today in the company you are working with and how does your weeks and days pre-corona look like? So uh, I, I'm head of partnerships and uh, marketing, so I'm responsible for that on a global level. Um, if looking into uh, before the corona situation, I was very much traveling. So I was a part of heading up the UK office, which we launched in September last year. So my days and weeks very much looks into traveling. So um, I think I'm traveling on a regular basis during the autumn, definitely approximately two to three days a week. Uh, I had a couple of weeks back home, but, but uh, most of the weeks I was traveling. Uh, UK, of course, I spent a lot of time when we opened up the office and, and hired new people there and tried to establish the business and so on. Uh, and that's why also I think it's so interesting with the GBO that, that it is a global um global network of community where you can meet other members uh, in other countries. What, what, what different chapters have you, have you visited? So uh, I've been, of course, in, in Stockholm, uh, those only a couple of times. Uh, but in London, I think I visited London the most. Uh, I've also been in Mallorca uh, visiting those uh, a couple of times. Then I did aim to visit New York once in the beginning of, of this year, but I couldn't make it. And I think, uh, but those are the ones uh, that I've been a part of. Okay, really interesting. And you have been in the tech business for two, three years or more? Uh, I started out in the tech business in 2000, so it's actually 20 years. So, uh, yeah, that's a while ago. 
That's true. And how, how did you, what, what was the development from start or education up until where you are now, where you are uh, partnering in a, in, a, in a company and, and doing this uh, high level uh, work? So uh, actually, I came out of school, was working in in the retail uh, so I was working in the retail store became like uh, was involved in the store manager bits and pieces of it uh, and then we installed the new point of sale system and that company hired me by 2000 so I was a part of, of a tech business uh, providing point of sale solution for 11 years from 2000 to 2011 so that was where my journey started and I have a pretty uh, huge interest in tech and, and computers and so on. So I think that's why also I, I got the opportunity to, to join that company. Um, but I'm pretty much southern uh, along the journey. Uh, and then I think it was by the end of 2009 or 2008 or something, I started at IHM Business School. Uh, so then I took my marketing economic um, and that's it, more or less. Then it's uh, self-experienced, self-knowledge. But what I like right now, this is the third tech com company I'm a part of, uh, helping out growing on an international basis. And um, this is this is actually the, the the opportunity I have to do it in in the way that I thought could be even more successful of doing it. And I can definitely see the benefit out of being able to do it in a third time and also being able to do it your way. Okay. So your, your educational background is, um, uh, is uh, LHS, Life's Hard School. I have to say that. I like the school of life. Isabel, it's nice yeah. to meet you. I don't think we've encountered each other yet it's in GBO, and I'm, I'm sure we will at some point. And mm -hmm. certainly if you, you're very welcome to come and visit us in Valencia any time as well. Uh, I'd like yeah. to ask you um, what what it is about GBO and networking that you like or love and is important to you. Uh, there are several things. One thing is definitely that it's global. Uh, since I'm traveling so much, that we have opportunity to meet new people, to learn about new uh, industries uh, and other challenges and countries, and also the friendness which is within the dbo how everybody's helping each other out and how we can share knowledge and experience and so on and that's i think is a huge advantage excellent and where where would you like to go next when you are allowed to travel what's the first club you'd like to visit outside of your home club oh but i think it would be definitely new york would be great to to visit that one uh, I'm also happy to, to go uh, down to Spain uh, to, to see more countries over there. I mean, we are right now looking into where we're, where we're growing the business ourselves uh, because we're aiming to become a world-leading company. Uh, so it's a little bit now we try to understand which, which countries or which markets are mature to, to grow with, with a tech solution. So yeah. a little bit depends on that one, but other ones, I think the Dubai one is pretty interesting. I've been working with uh, Dubai in the past, so I have a pretty good network over there. So it would be interesting to to come back to those countries as well. Yeah, well, what, what, what's the state of play in your industry looking like at the moment? Oh, it, it's challenging, definitely. I mean, retail is suffering a lot at the moment. Uh, and, and since our solution is targeting the non-food retailer, those are definitely the most suffering. But what we can see is the retailer with, which has done their digital transformation journey, they are suffering less compared to the other ones because what we do provide is real-time data and you can see where you have your stock. Uh, a lot of lot of stores outside of like Sweden and so on, they are on lockdown, so they are closed. Uh, which means like you have a huge, massive amount of stock in store, which you can't get access to. You don't know what you have. So, so but the ones that do have real time data with, with uh, our solution or similar, they have an easier journey to provide the customer needs. So, but we see, uh, I see lights in the tunnel. Uh, we see new opportunities popping up and then we definitely see that things is starting to roll again. So, uh, 
I, I'm I'm pretty positive. That, that's that's great to hear, Isabel. I, have, John, John, and and Isabel, have you heard of the concept called Eli Five? No. Eli Five. No. Okay, it's it's spelled out. Explain it like I'm five years old. So what I would like you to, to, to do, Isabel, since you're in the tech business for our listeners, in just a few words, explain it to us like we were five. What is it that your company is actually doing? So what we are doing, we are providing a mobile point of sale solution, uh, which is like the checkout solution that the cashiers in the stores use, or you can use it as a self checkout solution. If you're going out to the store, you can scan your item yourself. But it's not just that, we do have also the unified commerce platform, meaning you connect the online world with the physical world. So independent on which store or if you are online, you see the same data, you see the, the, the accurate uh, stock levels. Uh, so you know that if you buy something online and let's say like it should be five in the stores, you will actually turn up having that. So you can buy online and pick that up in store. Or you can go into store and say, I would like to buy that particular shirt within a certain size, but the size doesn't exist in the store. Then the store staff can see like, yes, but this size does exist in that particular store. Do you would like me to order it to send it back to your home? Or would you like, would you like me to reserve it for you to pick up on your way on your home? So. To meet the customer expectation, because you as a customer, you, you would like to go there, you would like to buy the item. For you, it doesn't matter what it is, you want it. So it's more like you as a store staff, you should be embraced with technology so you can help serve the customer independent of where they are. Uh, one, one question that I'm curious about and that you and I have talked about before is, uh, what has been the biggest challenge for you over the years during your career? Oh, the biggest challenge. I think, to be honest, to be a woman in tech can be pretty challenging. Uh, definitely if looking back in the past from the beginning of the 20s, it, it wasn't, the market wasn't so mature to have a woman, to be a woman in tech position. You were pretty much asked to delay the bit. You needed to have more knowledge uh, in com compared to, to other ones. Uh, you needed to show that you actually you know what you're talking about. You needed to be more skilled. You needed to be more experienced. You needed always to prove yourself. It's it's a lot better today, uh, but if if we look 20 years uh, in the past, it was definitely a tricky world. Did you get a but lot of challenging? And I love the challenges. <laughs> Did you get a lot of mansplaining going on? People explaining things to you, you already kind of probably knew better than they did, right? Mm. Yes, yes. You, you needed to. You yeah. needed to. Hopefully, hopefully less people thinking that you don't know so much these days, right? No, def I mean, sometimes you pop up with the same situation, but, but you know how to manage it. So, so it's easier. It's always, I mean, it's still the same thing. I know that I need to know a lot more uh, compared to the ones that I meet or, or have a dialogue with or so on. Uh, definitely in and uh, within my kind of expertise. Uh, and, and based on the matter of fact that I've been working with this for for more or less 20 years, I think I have a huge amount of expertise. So, so it's it's uh, pretty good too. Are, are you seeing more women come into tech now? Definitely. Definitely. Uh, I see more women come into tech, but it's still, uh, I think the amount of a man in tech is still higher compared to women. What what do you think? What do you think would encourage more women into the industry? Oh, that that is interesting. I think it's also a matter of what you are interested in. Uh, not not all women are interested in in tech uh, and and doesn't understand and it's not they are not curious about it. So, to be honest, I don't know. I I heard someone. I don't remember the source now, but someone. Vaguely, I remember said that on a general level, women are more interested in people and men are more interested in things. But since knowing you, Isabel, you have combined the interest in people in the tech yes. business. Isn't that so? That's true. Yeah. So what would be your advice to someone 
I mean, you, you were not only a woman, obviously, you were also young. And I had that experience as well. I had my first sales manager position when I was 24, handling guys who were 10 years older than me. And I believe that I had a little bit of the same situation as you had, because being young is similar to being young and woman. Uh, what, what would be your advice to young people, not only women, when they enter new businesses or tech business? What's the strategy if you want to move forward fast? I think definitely show, I mean, be very much engaged, be passionate what you do, try to learn even more, dig into things, try to understand, try to help out uh, and definitely, I mean, show your feet, kind of say, and believe in yourself uh, because the knowledge is very much what you need. And if you show that you can help out and you grow and you learn things along the road, then it's easier to to take on new positions and to grow in, in the company. And that's what I did also in the first company uh, where I was in, during 11 years. I mean, I changed several positions along the road there. So it's a little bit work hard. I live very much in the world of presentations and, and the delivery of presentations. I, I coach people in doing that as well. And so I'm assuming you probably give a fair amount of presentations yourself and have done over your career. Is that is that fair to say? And uh, what has been your experience in delivering presentations and how have you developed and grown that you might be able to offer some insights and maybe even some tips to other people? Because this is an important area in business. Oh, that's good. Uh, I mean, I think I enjoy talking to people, so I'm very happy. I, I, I get a lot of energy when I get up on stage and being able to do a presentation, and not everybody has that uh, advantage, which I have, and I think that it, that makes life easier for me. Uh, and I'm, I'm pretty relaxed in what I do, and I if, if something goes wrong, something goes wrong. Uh, so it's more like stay a little bit like stay calm and believe in yourself. Uh, everybody's doing wrong things, uh, but also be prepared. Uh, don't show up with a presentation that you haven't walked through. Uh, be prepared and ready, and, and then you you will get a more self confident presentation when when you have it. So preparation definitely, and also try. I mean, it a little bit depends on how if, if you're new in doing presentation or if you've done it several times, but you can also do a presentation in front of your colleague or somebody else that can give you some feedback into it to say, like, okay, maybe you can change this or this or that. Uh, and also, um, there are a lot of good also insight if you Google on the internet how we can build up stuff so we have the right flow if you doesn't have the experience of that. So. You mentioned that sometimes things go wrong. What, what kind of things have gone wrong for you? What have been some of your uh, maybe more interesting experiences? Um, I mean, sometimes, oh, that, that was a good one. I tried to think, yeah, think about it. Uh, no, but it's typically if you're going to have a demo or a presentation, it's always the matter of, of something is growing wrong with the technology. Even if you tried it out and prepared everything, it's like it's 99 times so out of 100, something goes wrong. You know, it. so it's more like, OK, it, it wasn't according to plan. It could be some hardware is not working according to what you expected or is the network is locking down or whatever happened. Um, but top of mind, unfortunately, I don't have any good one uh, that pops up in my mind. John, it's interesting when, when you, because Isabella and I earlier talked about this. Uh, how, how do you handle that, John, when you have an extrovert like Isabel or an introvert, believe it or not, as me? I, I hate public speaking. I do it pretty well, but I hate it. Isabella does it really, really well, and she loves it. How do you handle people? Give us advice from an introvert and an extrovert position. Well, I'm I'm on the introvert side as well, Richard, which uh, for yeah, some yeah. people might might be hard to believe, but I, uh -huh. I can be a little socially awkward sometimes, just like me. Just mean it just means we shit our pants before we go yeah. on stage. Right? <laughs> <laughs> well, that that certainly used to be the case. I, I think yeah, really yeah. the the main difference is it, it's probably just easier. The extroverts are just a little less inhibited 
And, and that really is the only difference that the introverts are going to have to work a little bit harder to get to that stage because mm-hmm. you can and you will. Well, and, works, yeah. and, you know, Isabel very rightly mentioned about the energy when you're when you're giving a presentation, which is super important. And we need to have a, a really good, strong level of energy. It doesn't need to be like really super high. And it doesn't I mean, if it's too low, people are going to be falling asleep in the seats. So yes. it, it needs to be like a good energy, but maybe a, a, a bit higher than you might just naturally have pump yourself up a bit because the energy that you're in is going to be infectious to the people who are listening to you as well so put yourself in a really good state you'll more likely get on stage and remember you're doing it for them not for you you're you're giving them knowledge you're giving sharing information with them that's the reason you're there not to make yourself look better so it doesn't matter really if you make some mistakes if you mess things up a little bit um, when I've done that, I, you know, in, early on, you used to kind of think, well, that would screw everything up and would end up uh, falling apart in the presentation. But now, with some experience and practice, you can incorporate that. But you know, I, I loved that Isabel said that practice is the is the key as a trainer. Absolutely, yeah, that's, yeah. that is essential. One of the reasons why so many people are not confident in their presentations. Uh, it's because they wing it and, and because they think they can just get up there and speak and, and maybe even have an expectation of being able to do it well. And the uh, practice really is really is critical. That introvert or extrovert, you still need to practice. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I, I remember from, I used to be in, in the cosmetic business. We had sales conference every fifth, every six weeks and lots of presentations for distributors and customers. And my kids always said to my wife that, Mommy, why is daddy talking to, to himself all the time? Because I was brushing my teeth and then I'll say this, then I'll say that, and I'll go on. I was practicing, practicing. And that was, that was the way for me to, to move forward. Because when I do a presentation, I, I give energy, but I lose it. But you're different, Isabel, aren't you? Yes. How, <laughs> how, how does it work for you? Just I, 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 I'm bringing this up because I, I want our listeners to understand there are different strategies. We are different. We can do the same thing on the same good level, but it affects us as persons differently. So how is it for you? No, but I, I mean, if I do a presentation, of course, uh, I, I do prepare, I do practice, but, but I can't write like a, a full document of this is exactly what you're going to say. I only write bullets, so I do have an understanding of what I'm going to talk about for kind of each of the slides. Uh, but then it's more like kind of a feeling. If you're passionate about something, it's easy to talk about it because then you have the knowledge uh, of it and you feel confidence in what you're talking about as well. But I, I do love uh, having a speech. Uh, I think it's I think it's nice. Uh, but also afterwards, I do get a lot of energy. Uh, and of course, it's a little bit about the way it went as well, but but also to get the feedback from the audience, try to maybe ask them some questions to to interact with the audience also uh, during the speech um, and give the energy uh, which which you were talking about as well. I think that is important. One one of the biggest differences I, I find, and this isn't to, so much to do with presentation, but to do with the introverts and extroverts and the differences around that, is how we recharge re-energize ourselves the extroverts have a tendency to want to be more surrounded with people and get their energy from social situations introverts prefer a bit more to recharge a bit more privately to have time by themselves we, we have elements of both for sure but how do you like to relax and recharge Isabella and what do you do to maybe let off steam uh, no, but I think it, I think it, for, for me it's really bit both. I mean, of course, I need to recharge sometimes when you have had a very high workload. You need to recharge, and then I do travel uh, even <laughs> when I'm not working. So I'm traveling a lot, even in uh, my spare time. But however, uh, if looking into when I went to, for example, to Dubai uh, a couple of years ago with one of my friends on vacation. Uh, I anyway connected with a couple of partners so I met a couple of partners and and we were out having dinner together that is more just because I think it's so so fun to meet people and and to interact with new people so even if I'm on vacation I I can go for connect with my my business partners 
Uh, and that is how I, I, I need a combination of it. And I, I do love, and of course you have days when you don't want to meet people and you just lock the door and, and, and stay in bed or something. But I think it's, for me, if I would be in a position in Sweden where I haven't could meet, if we would have been in a complete lockdown, that was, would have been very, very hard for me. Uh, I, w- I would have gone insane, I think. So I'm pretty happy that we have been open. So I've been able to meet people and been able to talk to people, even if some of them is through Zoom or, or other web meetings. But just to be able to meet people is is great. That, that's that's a, It's a super interesting difference because, I mean, we live in the same city. And I haven't been on lockdown. But for me, being on lockdown wouldn't be a problem at all. I could be I could be on my own for... Three months, not a problem. So we, it means we're, we're, we're quite different. But on the strategy of connecting to an audience, uh, I always try to, uh, I, instead of getting people into a uh, uh, somewhere where I should speak uh, and get on stage when everybody, everybody was in, I was always trying to stay at the entrance and say hello and shake hands. You can't do that nowadays, but shake hands with as many as possible to get personal connection with as many people as possible before I got on stage. Have you tried that? Uh, no. It, I mean, sometimes I've had, if there have been less people in the audience, it really depends on where we are in the preparation for the, for the speech and what we're going to do if we still have maybe some sound check or something that we need to prepare. So, so it's been a little bit different. Uh, yeah. I have to say, but I've done it uh, when it has been a smaller um, kind of a... Yeah, I, I've done it with 150 people, but it depends on how you organize things. But it's, I think it's because I am an introvert. I need to get that connection and energy before I get on stage. Is that something that you have been into those thoughts as well, John? Yeah, absolutely. I think if you have the opportunity, if you're giving any kind of presentation or speech to mix and mingle with the audience beforehand, then it's going to be really advantageous because giving any kind of presentation, even even something like this, uh, requires some level of connection, some level of empathy going out towards uh, towards the people who may be watching and listening. So, so yeah, when you're giving a presentation, particularly if you are feeling like you're connected to some of the people that you're speaking to, you're going to make it that bit more personal. So you're not just reading a presentation or delivering something. You're actually talking to some friends, to some people who you know. And that does make uh, psychologically for us a big difference in how we deliver, but also a difference in how the presentations are received. So, yeah, I I really get what you're saying there. Oh, that's great. Isabel, um, you mentioned that, oddly enough, though you travel like every second week, three to five days before Corona and probably after, one of your private interests in life is to travel. So I guess you have the perfect job. But aside from that, on a personal level, if we would ask you the, the, the secret skill of Isabel, what is that? The secret skill of Isabel, yes. Uh, I do have some interests that might not be uh, I mean, I'm, I'm grown up in the northern part of Sweden, so I do love downhill skiing. Uh, I haven't done it this year. I didn't have a time before the corona came. But downhill skiing is definitely one of my favorites. Uh, otherwise, I do also, it's very much interesting into motorsport, uh, like uh, Formula One and so on, even if I don't think it's the same thing anymore since they did the regulation changes. Um, but I think uh, those are the interests are, are uh, the one that people doesn't know about me. And also from the past when I've been playing the flute uh, in an orchestra. Okay, so do you, have, have you done that for long? Is it the side flute? Yes, it's a side okay. flute, uh, but I did it, uh, now I stopped doing it, it's plus 20, 20 years ago, or if it's, no, it's 20 years ago, I stopped doing it, but I, I, I was pretty good at that point in time. <laughs> oh, that's interesting. I mean, you slightly remind me of a Finnish flute player on a great level. Do, do you know which, which one I'm, uh, uh, oh, it's, uh, oh, what's her name? I'll come back to that. <laughs> Do you think you might ever return to uh, to some musicality, Isabel? 
I mean, I've been also been a dancer. I've been drawing paintings and so on. So I think I do have the creative side of me as well, uh, very much. But but I don't have the time for it. Uh, but um, yeah. yeah. How how do you involve that creative side of yourself in what you do now? Oh, I think it's more like looking into how you can do things differently. Uh, how you can go outside the box and not doing exactly what other people are doing to, to so you get more attention. And definitely into marketing purpose, how can you do things smarter and in another way so you're not doing exactly the same as the other one to get more attention? So I think that's how I use the creative side right now and also looking into how can we present some uh, things and so on. So, yeah, definitely. So I just had to I, I just had to Google the person I was thinking about was playing the violin. So forget about it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I was wondering about you, Richard. Do you, an do you have a creative side, Richard? Are you musical at all? Well, actually, I do. My, my secret skill is woodworking. Oh. Yes, so I have a, a full shop in my summer house where I I, um, I make furniture and uh, that kind of thing. So it, it's a little bit of a, of, a, of a secret skill in a way. I come from a background where my, my father was in the construction business and he built our lake house starting in 1962. So I've, I've been there all my life in the summers and now all weekends and we've built more or less everything uh, on our own. So the last thing I... I built was a sauna. I think you joined me once virtually. Do, do you think that the podcast uh, uh, listeners podcast. and viewers wants to join us, join me in a virtual in sauna? sauna? <laughs> uh, only, on audio, right? Right? only on audio. <laughs> yeah, only on wow. audio. So there we, there we are. I, I built this one. <laughs> so that's my secret skill. And I'm, I'm odd in a way because... I never had any vinyl or CD records and I never listened to music while working like a lot of people do, but I'm quite good at guitar and singing. So, well, that's, uh, that's my secrets. Hmm? Isabella. Yes. Two, two things you love and two things you hate. Oh, uh, I have to say, looking into the situation we are in, definitely I will say being in a kind of a lockdown mode where yeah. you can't travel. Yeah. I'm such a restless guy now. Uh, I've been home for soon uh, three months, uh, and I don't know which year that happened. I've been torture for you. Torture. <laughs> it's a torture for me. So, so, so that is like a frustration, but I, I try to stay calm anyway. Uh, two things that I like, I mean, uh, traveling, I have to say then, because, and I love meeting new people, be outside, uh, definitely be outside and, and meet friends and family, do training and, and so on. Um, but the matter of fact that being in a lockdown and not being able to travel, that's, that's definitely torture. That's the two easy questions. Now mm -hmm. the two difficult ones. Wow. Wow. What do you hate? Do you hate? Two things. Oh, but, but except from being in lockdown, then, uh, mm -hmm. I two things that I hate. Oh, peep, uh, pessimistic people. Okay. I, I'm so much of a positive people, and I think, like, if you meet a challenge, you try to solve the problem and, and just pass through. Uh, and and if, you, if you stop and say, like, yes, but this is a problem we can't do, we can't do, we can't do, and it's like, okay, but how can we find a way forward? Uh, I don't want to go back and look into who did what and what was wrong. It's more like, okay, now we're here. How can, how can we move forward? And I mean, of course, I'm frustrating not being able to travel, but we are in a situation that we are. So it's just like, okay, you, you it's get it uh, and, and try to, to go through it as, as easy as possible, but stay positive. So to, to put it mildly, you don't like people who think that the glass is always half empty. No, correct. No. Yeah. <laughs> That's nice. But it's also interesting with looking forward and the not looking backwards and the non-blaming uh, culture that you can build. Because what I always said, and I tried to train my people when I had a lot of employees, was to 
to really move forward in a way where where you look at opportunities. And and I always said that the difference between a, a good organization or company or a bad one is how you solve problems, because problems will always show up. So what's your take? What's your take on that? Do you have a could you elaborate agree. on that? I completely agree with you. Uh, I think like, OK, you will always meet challenges. You will always meet problems. It's just a matter of how you're solving them and how you're tackling them. And you don't. I can be I can have a discussion and be pretty upset. But but I, when we have discussed and gone through things, uh, I can leave it behind and then I move forward. Uh, so it's like I, I'm not the person that go into depth and, and become angry for a long time or period. It's like, okay, when we discussed it, I'm over and out and then I move forward and take the next step and look into, okay, what what should we do right now? How how can we navigate in where we are? So definitely completely agree with you. I, I'm a big believer in education and lifelong education. And I tend to find that most people in business, most people who are doing really well also are uh, what's your take on educating for yourself and what are the things you might recommend for someone who's looking to follow a similar path to yourself? I think today definitely education is, is beneficial because uh, you will learn things that you might not don't know how to Google or how to find, but, but there's a lot of information out. In, in I read a lot of articles uh i listen to some podcasts sometimes uh, i get news um, i'm a subscription of different newsletters on emails so i try to stay up to date with what's happening in our industry and so on so we can try to navigate but it, but it's still it's a matter of fact but also in terms of management and skills i will definitely uh one thing that i would like to look into is more like management uh, leaderships uh training uh, that i think you can always develop you can always be better and you can always get tools to help you become better and to to be able to navigate more easy so i think from a personal perspective that that is something that i'm going to look into when i get some more time what for you is the maybe your top most important business skill? Uh, I think that I can do everything to if looking into the team that I'm having right now is more like I'm working on a strategic level, but I can also do I can also do stuff on an operational level. I can sit sit down and write something. So I do I do have the the entire bandwidth of doing things. And of course, what I do as well, I try to hire people that has better knowledge compared to myself to complement because I can't have all the skills. So in terms of the marketing team, I, the colleagues which is working with me, I don't have their skills at all. So they need to complement us in order to be able to, to deliver on the pool. But I need to understand of an overall picture in order to try to navigate where we're moving. So in terms of hiring people, definitely hire people which is greater than yourself. Uh, but then also you need to have an understanding. So, so you can't just be kind of a manager. You need to understand your employee and you need to be able to help out and try to solve problems and so on when, when navigating and moving. You, you mentioned before that you're working, you've been working in Dubai, right? Mm -hmm. And I know you've been working in the US and the UK. And you're, you're Swedish and you come from the same background as I do. If you look at the management styles in Dubai, US and Sweden, how would you see the differences and how would you compare? And is there a difference between how we do things and how you, you see things in those areas of the world? I mean, it's definitely on a cultural level. Uh, it's completely different. Uh... I mean, it's more hierarchy in the States, it's more admin, you need to do all these admin work and follow-ups and so on. If you're looking into Dubai, Dubai and the Middle East regions, those, I think the business over there is more based on relationship and networking. So uh, on a very high, very high level, those are the b biggest differences in, in those two countries. But you need to be able to adapt to the different uh, cultural changes, which are in all the 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 countries when you are traveling when you're traveling and working with different 
with different markets. Uh, otherwise, you won't be accepted by the markets itself. So you need to understand and you need to try to navigate in the way they are navigating. Now, I, I always said in, in the selling situation, I, I mean, I was, I've been a distributor for brands in more than 30 countries. And for me, the most important thing has always been to build rapport. I mean, like, like the, the, the way I described it, you say hello to as many people as possible when you do a lecture or you do a presentation. To build rapport, you need to understand where they come from and then you can adapt to that, uh, which is because sometimes I feel that it's, it's a little bit from the American side, sometimes also from the Swedish side, it's a lot of inside and out. This is how we do it and this is how you should do it too. But all business is local. How, how do you see that? No, uh, completely. It's, it's all business is local and you, and you need to have your ears and feet on the ground and understand how they are working and, and what they are doing. And of course, uh, they were pretty interesting sometimes when you showed up in a meeting in, in Middle East or uh, I was in, in Charda, uh, which is in the north of, of uh, Dubai. Uh, and those are, if looking into Dubai itself in Charda, those are like if traveling to two completely different countries, at least when, when going entering a meeting. Uh, so that was interesting. interesting. Well, one, of, uh, one of my favorite books is by um, Ray Dalio, and it's his book on principles. I wonder for you, what are some of your leading guiding principles in life and business? I definitely think stay positive. Uh, as we were talking about in, in the past, uh, you will end up always having challenges and problems, but, but keep calm and stay positive. Uh, in a matter of fact, if you're growing for hell, keep going. <laughs> like churches, about, a little bit above that, and, and you know, you will solve it. And it will come something better out of a challenge as well. So that is that is definitely something that I, but from a personal perspective, but also in a business perspective, I very much bring with me. It's a good philosophy to have. Keep keep going, keep taking action, even when things are getting tough. Yeah. What's, what's something that you, quarantine or not, what's something you can't live without? Oh, I will say music. I mean, you can put yourself into different modes with music. Yeah. Uh, and, and sometimes you need more positive energy, maybe, depending on where you are. And then you can put out some positive music that gets you a good feeling. So, uh, no, I was a music based. I know that. I think it's a proper thing also to, to ask John now. What's your secret skill? My secret skill? Um, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I am musical as well. I, I play piano and I play the trombone and the euphonium, although I haven't played those for a few years. Maybe we can have an orchestra. Yeah, we, <laughs> we, could, <laughs> we could perhaps do that. So th those perhaps things that people people don't know so much about me, but uh, I'm trying to think of other ones. And, and I, I have a, a black belt in two different martial arts as well. Uh, so I guess not, not too many people know that. I, I used to do kickboxing. I'm, I'm too old for that now. Uh, and I, I more recently been doing ninjutsu, the art of ninjutsu. And so uh, okay. I, I, I guess not too many people would guess that looking at me. So. <laughs> Why not? I don't know. I don't, I don't look mm -hmm. like most people imagine a martial artist to look, perhaps. Well, you don't sound like one, but... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> you sound so nice. Very yeah. peaceful and relaxed. But it, it means you, you have a lot of Zen and that kind of thing as well, because it's part of the philosophy. Yes, I, I love meditation and, and Tai Chi as well, another martial art, really. But uh, mm -hmm. yeah, I, I, I'm very... Is, is Isabel on, on the Zen uh, more philosophical level? Is, is there any, any direction that you... Uh, have been into or, or testing or trying? No. Just being positive. Yeah. Being positive. yeah. <laughs> well, that's, that's, that's actually a good start. On education, uh, if, if you would recommend, where is, which one is your go-to author, book, podcast, YouTuber, whatever for inspiration and education? Is it One Purpose with Jay Chetty? Uh, because that one is both from like a personal level, but also sometimes ties into uh, ties into a little bit 
work life as well, but I think, uh, I don't know if you know the guy, which has been a monk in the past. Yeah. So I think, uh, on purpose, I think it's made called. I think that one is pretty inspiring and it give, gives you some insight, uh, because it's all, it's a matter of fact, always about yourself and you can always affect things yourself and to strengthen yourself. So, so you need to build up your own self confidence and, and stay. Yeah, stay where we are within yourself. Okay. If if you would, with your experience now, if you would just say a few words on why should someone join GBO, what would you say? Uh, definitely uh, connecting with people uh, to share experience, knowledge uh, with each other, but also to be able to meet people within new markets, new countries, because it might be an opportunity for your business to enter another market. And definitely now also when we do have the virtual meeting, it's also easier to connect with with other people in, in new markets to, to understand who you are. And, and then you have this site where you can log in to search for a different skill if you need any people. So, so there is a huge opportunity and, and um, you don't have to look only into your local market to, to work in. It might be that you can expand your business on another level with this uh, community. Excellent. So are we going to be having GBO meetings in your sauna anytime soon, Richard? Is, is that going to be? <laughs> I, I'm not sure that's uh, politically correct or, uh, or uh, appropriate, but uh, John, if you come to Stockholm, I will definitely uh, offer you a sauna. That's, that's very yeah, kind. That's I look forward to it. And, and for me, be, being Swedish, my wife is half Finnish. We do it all the time. Actually, one of the Finnish traditions that she has is sometimes when we have very good friends over for dinner, we do it Finnish style, which means that people come over, the sauna is warm. Uh, we have already done our sauna. We do the dinner while we offer our guests a sauna. And then they can up to the house and have a dinner, which is a Finnish tradition. So that, that might be one thing. Do you have any experience of sauna, Isabel? Is that one of the things you do? Only when you do downhill skiing, when you are up yeah. in the mountains, yeah. Uh, yeah. that it's typical you do the sauna, but otherwise it's, it's not that common. You, you like the Afri skier? Yeah? That is good as well. After you da- after you down the downhill skiing and after <laughs> skiing, then you do the zona. <laughs> or as we call it now, a Corona moment. <laughs> <laughs> if if you were reason. rewarding yourself, Isabel, and and this is for Richard as well, really. But if you're rewarding yourself, what would you reward yourself with? Isabel, you're to start. Um. I think the matter of fact, uh, I'm, I'm pretty good in, in engaging people and stay passionate so I can get people working along with me and then just, I'm stay positive. And I, this is typically a thing that people used to say, you're always smiling. But the matter of fact, I, that, I think that I do that 99% of my time. But it's a little bit by keep happy, uh, stay happy in life. So I think I'm, I'm pretty good in trying to see the light out of things. I mean, more, more along the lines of what would you give yourself if you've done something really well, like set oh. up as a, a rewarding gift to yourself? Okay. I think uh, maybe buy something nice or maybe uh, maybe travel somewhere. A trip. <laughs> I, I have to say, John, that, that uh, I, was, I had time to think when Isabel was explaining her both ways of looking at the question, how to reward yourself. I'm, I'm not very good at it. I have to be better. Uh, but I, 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 I get more rewarded by doing something for someone else, to be honest. So doing something for my kids or for my wife, that's very rewarding for me. For example, I canceled my own birthdays 25 years ago and said, I don't want to have any gifts. So I'm I'm an old person. Wrong question for me. <laughs> yes, typically you don't do it because you're just moving on to no. the next thing to do. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. so that is the easiest way of doing it. Uh, mm-hmm. So. You, but okay, I will make a promise. I will up until the next podcast, 
I will give myself a reward and I will report next time. Is that okay, John? That sounds good to me. That's really great. That's really great. So I think we will be uh, wrapping up. Uh, Isabel, it was great to have you with us. Thank you for sharing. Uh, and to the audience, John, thank you for being here. Sorry, Maiten couldn't be with us, but she had other, other more pressing engagements. Sometimes it is like that. I mean, she's an entrepreneur. She has to put business first sometimes. So to the audience, if you want to comment or say anything or give us a tip or a lead on who to, to interview in the podcast, please email podcast at globalbusinessowners.com. And, uh, Isabel, thank you. Uh, we'll see you guys uh, next time. Sure. Thank you too. Thank you for having yeah. me. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Ron. Bye bye. Are you a game changer, a startup founder, a high impact investor, entrepreneurial minded, a business owner with a global mindset? Welcome to the world of global business owners. I'm Richard, global president of GBO. We are a rapidly expanding international business networking club with established chapters in 24 cities and more than 650 members worldwide. Among our esteemed members are many accomplished business owners, which include partners of prodigious law firms, founders of high-tech startups, elite yacht brokers and experienced investors, to name a few. We created GBO to help people like you facilitate lifelong business friendships, to give leaders a platform to share knowledge, to allow for the open discussion of ideas and to create business opportunities for GBO members around the world. Experience a different kind of business network, one that doesn't come with strict membership rules or expensive club fees. GBO offers a relaxed social environment that connects people with knowledge knowledge with ideas, and ideas with opportunities. We invite you to join us in building a significant global business network with the goal to forge a community of 50,000 global members in 500 city chapters all around the world as DBO becomes a key community in the global business environment. Begin your journey today and join us as an honored guest at one of the next local chapter meetings in your city to experience the spirit and philosophy of GBO. Simply complete the guest request form on our website and one of our dedicated guest managers will be in contact with you to assist you in booking a guest seat and to answer any questions. I hope to see you at the next GBO event. Welcome to GBO. Welcome by GBO. Bienvenido a GBO. Welcome to GBO. Welcome by GBO. Welcome to GBO.